Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show is brought to you by Air Patrol North. Visit airpatrolnorth.ca. Today's guest is former Grey Cup hero Pat Woodcock, who could whip you into better shape than you ever thought possible. Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show. Coming up! Our guest today hails from Ottawa, Ontario. He is a former wide receiver. He starred at Syracuse University. He was a Big East all-academic team member. He played in the NFL for the New York Giants. He played in the CFL for Montreal, Ottawa, Edmonton, and Hamilton. He was a top Canadian in the 2002 Grey Cup game. He set a Grey Cup record for the longest catch and a touchdown. Eight years as a professional a health and fitness coach. He is founder of the Elite Man Method. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program, Pat Woodcock. Pat, great to have you here, my friend. Great to be here, Joe. Thank you. Well, let's begin at the beginning. Uh, what made you decide that you wanted to be a football player? You know what? Football was just part of my childhood. Both my parents you know, played touch football when I was growing up, so I was kind of always out and around the, the game. Uh, and watching CFL games was a huge part of of our family. It was always on whenever there was a game on the old CBC uh, broadcast. So uh, I was just always around the game. Um, you know, my parents loved it, and uh, it just is something that uh, I obviously had an affinity for, and, and quickly discovered that I was pretty good at. So I thought I would stick with it for a little while. And tell us about the road to get to Syracuse. Yeah, I mean, uh, back at the back at that time, there wasn't a ton of Canadians going down to the NCAA. Um, I was fortunate. I had a coach when I was 15 or so who kind of took me aside one day and he had played NCAA football previously and just said, you know, you have some ability. You, this might be something that's on the horizon for you. Um, and then that, that kind of became my goal after that point. And so it's something that I worked towards. And I was fortunate on a, on a future team when I was uh, 16 or 17. Uh, my coaches used to go to the Syracuse University Coaches Clinic. So they had a bit of a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the coaches there. And so uh, at that time, there was no you know, YouTube clips. So they took my VHS highlight tape and put it in the coach's hand uh, for him to watch. Uh, and and uh, they, they invited me down for, for a camp uh, on campus. And uh, everything just kind of took off from there. And you got a full ride? Yes. Yeah. Uh, they, they offered me a full ride. And, and I pretty much accepted on the spot. Uh, as it was early, it was, uh, like Canada day weekend, right before my senior year of high school. And then I got a few other offers. Michigan recruited me in the fall and Michigan was kind of my team when I was growing up. Uh, but I had already committed to Syracuse and I was, I was kind of comfortable with the situation there. So I, I stuck with my decision. Well, you were uh, at Syracuse, you had a very successful career. Tell us about, uh, being on the big East all academic team. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that uh, just trying to be kind of all round, um, you know, well-rounded individual. And, you know, that goes back to that old saying of, of kind of the way you do one thing is how you do everything. Right. And, and so for me, uh, being good in school and, and just kind of trying to always achieve the highest levels that I could, uh, that carried over into the classroom as well as the football field. So um, I think it was I think you had to have a, a 3.0 grade point average to be on the honor roll, which is essentially a B. Um, and, uh, and I was able to do that every semester that I was there and, and, uh, and obviously graduate a little bit early and, and uh, be able to use my degree later on in life after my football career was over. Uh, was a business degree. Is that what you got? It was. Yeah. Business marketing. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, make, makes sense. And, and we'll get into what you're doing now uh, later on. So that was yes. probably, probably a good goal in, in any Avenue. So I thought yeah. it was a, it was a good one to choose. <laughs> Yeah, as opposed to, say, philosophy or, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, you, uh, in addition to being a pretty smart guy, you're obviously a good enough football player to catch the eye of the New York Giants. Tell us, you weren't drafted, but tell us about that, uh, about getting the call from the Giants. And yeah, that was that was pretty cool. I mean, it's, um, you know, the, the, the draft is a stressful process and, you know, you, you kind of get, you go through the process and the, the combines and the pro days and all that kind of stuff and, and, kind of get a grade. And so, you know, my grade was, could potentially be drafted anywhere from the fourth to seventh round, but, but likely a free agent. Um, and so at the time, 
Uh, I believe I had three teams that that expressed interest: uh, the Giants, the Bills, and I can't honestly remember what the third one was. Um, and uh, you know, we just kind of made the decision that the Giants was was going to be the best fit. And uh, and yeah, it was you know. You go through the whole draft day and kind of waiting for that phone to call and waiting for that phone call to come and, and it, it doesn't happen, which is disappointing. Uh, but obviously you, you get that opportunity to uh, to get on the phone and, you know, talk to the pro personnel guy and realize that this is actually going to happen. And, you know, the contract comes and uh, kind of starts the whole process. So uh, very, very cool, you know, heading into Syracuse from high school. I didn't necessarily have the NFL on my horizon. I think I always viewed uh, the CFL being you know, what I was working towards and, uh, and to, to have that opportunity to go in the NFL and, and then be able to do it again a couple of years later was, uh, was certainly very cool. And, and, uh, really just kind of, it gave me a ton of confidence, you know, I think heading into the rest of my career, um, at Syracuse, obviously I was successful, but we didn't throw the ball a ton. So, you know, as a receiver, um, you know, that's obviously an important part of developing your game. And I think just being in that NFL environment and competing against those guys gave me a ton of confidence to kind of bled into the, the remainder of my career moving forward. Well, and, and it must have felt pretty good. I can imagine that uh, being told by the Giants that you'd made the team. I mean, an NFL yeah. football player. That, that's kind of fun. Yeah, it was, you know, it was one of those things I think, you know, you go back and uh, I, I honestly had no idea what to expect, obviously, heading into an NFL training camp and I'm pretty sure I went into training camp ranked, you know, kind of number 16 out of the 16 receivers that were there. Uh, but I just, you know, put my head down and went to work. And I didn't, I just, like I said, I didn't know any better. I just went and busted my butt every day. Um, and I was fortunate that there were some injuries during training camp. So I was able to get a lot more reps than I probably would have before. Uh, and I was able to take advantage of them and uh, continued to make plays, whether I was running with the the threes, the twos, or even, you know, the occasions that I had to run with the ones. And uh, continued to make plays and be in the right spot and, and kind of know what I was doing all the time. And uh, just obviously led to uh, led to me making the team uh, at the beginning of the season. After the NFL experience, wasn't that long, a few games, but uh, yeah. certainly it, it was an experience, I think, that had to that bode well as you headed into a, a CFL career. Uh, joining yep. the Alouettes uh, in, in the 2002 season was your fir- first full season with the Alouettes. And that went Pretty well. I mean, you helped lead the team to the 2002 Great Cup game and a frosty yes. day in Edmonton against uh, the Eskimos. <laughs> Edmonton is my hometown, so I know about the frostiness. Uh, and, yes. you, of course, you had the big play of the game. Here it is. Caught this pass from Anthony Calvillo, who is not a bad quarterback. Got behind that Edmonton defense. And look at the wheels on this guy. Tell us about what happened <laughs> at your experience, sir. Yeah, the game, I mean, obviously the season there was uh, was pretty awesome. You know, it's it's amazing, you know, when you kind of have all the pieces and um, and just kind of everything goes your way for the cor- over the course of a season, right? You've got a great coach, like you said, a great quarterback, great receivers, an amazing defense, and it all just really came together that season, super successful and, and got to the game. And the game was, like, Frosty's not even the word. It was, uh, the field was treacherous, uh, I don't even remember. I think I had some type of broom ball type shoes on for that long run, which is, uh, you know, crazy. But it was, uh, you know, like I said, CFL was a big part of my life growing up. So that was a dream come true. That whole week, just being in the Great Cup and, and having that opportunity and then uh, being able to to make the big play and, and win the game. And, uh, you know, it was pretty surreal and, and absolutely a dream come true for, you know, a Canadian kid who grew up with the, the Great Cup being the, the biggest day of the year in, in his family. Right. So. It was, uh, it was very special and uh, obviously a, a fantastic memory that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. Uh, no question about that. 99 yards for the touchdown, the longest touchdown catch in Grey Cup history at the time. It's since been broken, at the but time. that's okay. Al's went on to win yep. it. Uh, you were named top Canadian in the game, well-deserved. Uh, getting that Dick Suderman trophy from Commissioner Tom Wright at the time. Uh, tell us about that experience and what, what, what was that like? Yeah, again, pretty, pretty surreal. You know, obviously, as a Canadian kid, I, I kind of focused on the Canadian players as a fan when I was growing up and, and had a lot of favorites. And, uh, you know, I mean, just standing, just seeing that right now, just standing there holding the Great Cup casually as I'm talking with the commissioner is, uh, it's it's very cool. And, you know, um, as you know, probably, you know, a lot of the players get to take the Great Cup home for a day after, you know, after the fact. And, yeah. you know, just thinking about, you know, those, those pictures that I have with the Great Cup in my home and, you know, just the, the places that cup has been and, and the, the things that I was able to do with it is, uh, it's just a, it's just it's very surreal. Even looking back at it now, you know, it's been, 
Uh, geez, more than 20 years uh, since that happened. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a great memory that uh, obviously brings back a lot of emotion and, and, uh, and just, just great, great feelings about the game itself and, and obviously the career that I had and then some of the great teammates and coaches that I had along the way. Okay, what's your favorite day with the Great Cup story? Oh, it's so good. Uh, so they, it's, you know, you hear the stories about the Stanley Cup and how pristine it is and it's carried yeah. around with the guys in white gloves and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's not how the Great Cup is. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I won't mention names, but a, a certain guy uh, had it before me. He was in Montreal. And uh, so I was in Ottawa. And so the idea was we're going to meet halfway, right? He's going to drive an hour. I'm going to drive an hour. We're going to hand it off. And, uh, and then I'll have it for the day. So um, get up in the morning and, uh, you know, I kind of get to my spot. I'm trying to get him on the phone. Nothing, 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 not getting anything. Um, and I can't remember how I figured it out. But anyways, he wasn't up. He was, he had parted uh -huh. all night with the breakup <laughs> and whatever. So I ended up driving all the way to Montreal to his house. Um, the gray cup is in a duffel bag on the front porch. Um, <laughs> just sitting there waiting for me. Not, no, no security, obviously no guy with white gloves. It's just sitting <laughs> on the front porch. Uh, so I'm pretty heated at this point. So I kind of bang the door and get in and, you know, kind of give him a piece of my mind real quick and then go out, grab the, grab the cup. And I, I've made arrangements obviously. Right. And, you know, I have kind of appointments that I'm doing. And, and one of the things that I was doing, uh, was taking it to the children's hospital here in Ottawa. So, um, you know, I had a, a time to be there and I needed to get back. So I'm a little off schedule now. So I'm, I'm pretty heated, but anyways, uh, we get it back and then it's, so it's got the two handles on the side. The one handle is not attached at the bottom anymore. So it like <laughs> turns it kind of wobbles this way. <laughs> so kind of having to be careful with it over the course of the day, but we had a great day with it. You know, we took it to children's hospital, took it around to see a bunch of kids. Uh, I took it to my youth football team. They had a practice that day. So I took it to their practice and everybody took out a picture. Uh, I took it to see some friends, obviously, and then, um, you know, had it at home and, and took some cool pictures, you know, like put it in my shower and pretended I was eating cereal out of it and that kind of stuff. So, uh, and then we took it out that night and, you know, had a good time, took it to a club and, you know, everybody had a chance to drink out of it and, and that kind of stuff. So uh, very, very cool, uh, you know, awesome to, to do that and, and be able to share it with, you know, so many people who were part of my journey along the way and uh, just let them experience that cup and, and uh, kind of the thrill of, of drinking champagne out of the great cup. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine just the stuff that uh, has been drank or eaten out of that great cup. <laughs> yeah, we washed it really, really well. Before we drank out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it makes sense. Okay, so Okay, back to your career now. We, we, we all know that football can be a dangerous sport. You know that as well as anybody. We got some action of you when you're uh, with, the, with the Renegades. You're playing in your hometown. <laughs> and this pass yeah. is coming your way. And you're absolutely smoked by Winnipeg linebacker Terry Ray. Uh, couldn't yep. see it coming. A devastating hit. Now, you're listed at 5'9", 175 pounds. Uh, what was the result of this hit? Uh, there wasn't really much result. I mean, it, it, uh, it certainly knocked the wind out of me and, and, uh, you know, I was, I was a little bit sick on the field, didn't feel real well. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't actually miss any plays. Like that was, a probably a second down play. We went off the field. I kind of recovered and came back and played the rest of the game. So it, it was definitely a big hit and, you know, obviously the highlight hits and, and that kind of stuff. But I mean, you play long enough those things are going to happen. Right. And, uh, um, you know, if you're a receiver, you're going to go across the middle, you know, it's your job to go catch the ball. So you go do it. And sometimes there's hazards involved in doing that. And uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you never got hit going across the middle, then then you didn't run your routes properly or the quarterback wasn't throwing you the ball for whatever reason. So uh, that's, that's part of the gig, man. Part of the gig, part of the paycheck. Well, as you, as you mentioned, yeah, didn't miss a play, stayed in the game. And a short time later, we got video of you, same game and making an, a nice catch uh, with the defender draped all over you. Uh, do you remember the game very well? Uh, does it stick in your mind, this particular game? That particular one? Uh, I don't, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, no, I don't, I don't remember that particular one. I mean, there, there was a few in there. I know I had some good games against Winnipeg. I don't remember if this was a specific one or not, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's no different than any other position, right? You, you're going to have some good plays and some bad plays, and you got to understand that the, the guy across from you gets paid the same way that you do. So. You're not going to win them all. You're going to take a big hit, but you got to come back and make the catch on the next one at the same time. 
Well, after the after the hit you took previously, it, it just it's 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 easy to think that perhaps you might be just a little bit gun shy the next time you run a route, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, right? absolutely. But you know, it's uh, again being being one of the smaller guys on the field and, uh, and you know playing playing for long enough, whether it's college and the pros, you get those hits and you realize that yeah, yeah, it, it sucks in the moment, but uh, but yeah, mm-hmm. you're you're fine. You get back up and you go play again. There's no there's no lasting damage that we know of. Uh, so you, you know, right. head out and you, you do it again and anticipate that you're going to make the play, not him. Right. So eight, eight years in, in, in pro football, that's a pretty good career in, in the yeah. pros, no doubt about that. So after the career came to an end, uh, you got into the fitness business, which is, a, a, you know, pretty, was it an easy transition for you? Um, I would say, yeah, pretty much. You know, one of the things, you know, as, as I got older and played for, for a longer period of time, uh, you know, you quickly become the old guy in the locker room and, and you got to figure out ways to stay healthy and stay on top of your game because the younger guys are coming up trying to take your spot every day. Um, so I, I started to get more and more invested in my off-season program. And instead of just kind of doing what my strength coach told me, I wanted to know why I'm doing it this way versus that way and why we're doing this this year when we did it something different last year. And so I just, you know, I kind of accumulated some of this knowledge and, and uh, you know, we kind of became really interested in that side of things. And so it just seemed like a really easy or a natural transition to, to then take that knowledge and, and go and apply it to kind of the next generation of athletes coming up um, uh, who wanted to have kind of the same opportunities that I did. So um, it, in that sense, it was a, a pretty easy transition and also, you know, gym environments similar to the locker room environment, right? So you know, obviously, you know, hear you guys talk about all the time, the thing they miss the most about the game is being around the guys and being in the locker room and that kind of stuff. And um, this kind of gave me an opportunity to have an aspect of that in my life, even in my post football career. And the Elite Performance Academy, the, the gym you opened up, uh, you know, this is a lot of this was, I, I know, getting football players ready for the season. Uh, and tell us about moving on and developing the, uh, the Elite Man Method. Yeah, so it just kind of became, uh, it was twofold. It was a bit of a natural progression for me uh, as I got older and kind of realized that, you know, staying in shape isn't as easy as it was when you were 25 and uh, that the stresses and things that come with, you know, running a business and having a family and all those kind of things that, that make it more and more difficult to to stay at the top of your fitness and the top of your health as you get older. Uh, but in addition to that, I started seeing a lot of my friends and even some of the parents of the guys I was coaching uh, that really needed the help, um, you know, that really that really were struggling with fitness and struggling with health and, you know, spending a lot of time in business and that kind of stuff and, and really neglecting um, their physical side. And so it, it really became uh, those two things together really made it a, a real natural transition for me to move into, um, you know, training generally men that are 40 plus, very busy, have families struggling to stay in shape, struggling to have the energy that they used to have, um, and, and just not feeling like they're their best anymore, right? Not, not being able to give their best to their family, to their business, to themselves. Um, and uh, it's been really, really uh, great to kind of make that transition. You know, I had the chance to, to be a strength coach for the, re- uh, the Red Blacks. Uh, so I had a chance to do that in pro football and kind of did a lot of things as a strength coach. And I was, you know, not Board, but I, I, did, I had achieved a lot, worked with a lot of different people, a lot of different athletes. And I had this opportunity now to move into really helping people beyond, you know, we want to win games. We want to get stronger. We want to get faster. Now, like we're, we're, we're improving people's lives now. Like we're, we're helping guys live better lives, be better for their families, be better for their business. Uh, and it's been very, very rewarding to, uh, to be able to, to move into that, that side of things and, and, uh, and really grow a community of, of men who, who want to be at their best and, and feel fit and strong and full of energy. Yeah, you mentioned it earlier when you talked about, you know, uh, your your GPA and everything else, like being good in one thing is kind of leads to be good in a lot of things. And and it's sort of connected when it comes to fitness, too, isn't it? Like, what are some of the 100%. what are some of the keys to, to the elite man method? Yeah, it's really just about um, having kind of everything synchronized in the right direction. So there's lots of guys that exercise and there's lots of guys that kind of uh, eat, eat clean or, or whatever they want to call it. But it, it may not be. Uh, they may not be synchronized towards reaching the goal that you're looking for, right? Because there's a ton of information out there and you never know that, you know, is this the right diet for me? Is this the right exercise plan for me? So what I did is I kind of, you know, through a little trial and error and a little bit of experimentation on myself and, and obviously a lot of research, 
figured out, you know, the best workout plan and the nutrition plan that goes with it that really fits what 40 year old and beyond men need uh, in order to, you know, like I said, maximize energy, get stronger, lose body fat, um, increase, you know, kind of get the hormones working the way we want them to again, because that's, that's obviously a big factor as we get older. Uh, and really just kind of making all those lifestyle tweaks to make sure that they're all pointing in the same direction so that the body can do what we're asking it to do. Because it, when you kind of piecemeal things and you grab a nutrition plan from here and a workout plan from here, you know, it can be the body doesn't necessarily know what you're doing and you might be choosing things that while they might be good on their own, they're not the right fit for you. So um, it's really just trying to streamline and create one solid blueprint for guys to follow that gives them the results that they're looking for uh, and allows them to kind of get off that that hamster wheel of, you know, continually spinning their wheels and not getting any results that they want because that's incredibly frustrating. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I Well, back in the day, you know, I do 10 reps of five different exercises and, that, and that's what I do and forget about eating properly and everything else. But, you know, uh, my yeah. wife likes to say that, uh, you know, a weight is lost in the kitchen. Uh, and certainly would you agree with that? Uh, <laughs> with that uh, philosophy? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, your, your exercise is to get strong and to be physical and, and to, you know, improve your heart health and that kind of stuff. And, and fat loss generally comes on the nutrition side of things. If you're, if you're trying to lose fat through your exercise, that's going to be a frustrating process. You want to use exercise to, to improve your body and get stronger and build muscle uh, and, and kind of, you know, spur the systems on a little bit. But the true fat loss is going to come from, you know, pairing that up with a good nutrition plan that, that gives you the right amounts of not just overall calories, but the right amounts of proteins and fats and carbs along with that uh, to make sure that, you know, your body can do the things that you're asking it to do. Right. So, uh, you know, there was a time when I used to, you know, I just, I would run, I, I, I used to run like probably five, six K a day and, and then you yep. know, longer days, longer runs sometimes on the weekend and that type of thing. And, um, it, yeah, I mean, it used to keep the weight off no problem, but I found that as I got a little older, the metabolism changed a little bit and running just wasn't doing it for me anymore. Not yep. only that, but I was, you know, starting to get a lot of injuries, you know, some, yes. some uh, problems with my Achilles and everything else. And, Plantar fasciitis and everything else. So, uh, you know, so the the uh, the injuries mount and and the uh, and the weight loss isn't happening. And so, a couple of years ago, my wife and I during the during COVID, we both started trying the keto diet. We both tried the keto okay. keto diet. We were very we were really uh, you know committed to it for probably about a year and a half. I dropped forty five pounds. And, you know, nice. I still look still look pretty good. Now, what I the kind of diet I'm on is more I would call it a Cheeto. It's kind of like, uh, okay, yeah. I, I, there's more, there's more car. It's, it, it, it is difficult. It is a difficult diet to follow, you know, religiously, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. because it's, it, you know, that limiting that the carbs to that degree is the difficult process. Is that something you recommend or is there something that you, you, you would tweak in that? <laughs> So, you know, everybody's individual, obviously, and, uh, and some things that are going to work for some are not going to work for everybody. For me, I'm not a huge fan of completely eliminating uh, a macronutrient, like eliminating carbs, which so many people try to do, just because it is so hard to maintain. And if that's kind of your, if that's your rule, I'm just not going to eat carbs. Well, then as soon as you eat carbs, you're immediately off plan and you feel frustrated and now you're disappointed and all those kind of things. And it just kind of snowballs from there. Um, so what I like to do is, is really uh, educate guys on, on how to incorporate all three macronutrients in, in the proper way and be able to adjust them as they go. So, you know, we, we go through phases, certainly where we uh, bring carbs way down, but we don't eliminate them completely. And uh, one, the, the two biggest things that are kind of the, the golden rules that I give to my guys and that are kind of good for everybody is obviously you need to know your calorie number and then you need to know your protein number. And if you hit those two, you're pretty much going to be on point. You can kind of play around with the carbs and fat a little bit, as long as you're kind of staying with un underneath those calorie numbers that you've set. Uh, but if you hit calories and you hit protein, you're going to be on the right track for, for the most part. And another thing is too, is like my wife has struggled with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, arthritis and she had, you know, she's had two hip replacements and, and, uh, I don't think you can have any more if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless one doesn't so, take, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, so she's had two hip replacements and, uh, but she found that as a result of cutting down carbs, the inflammation is reduced and, and that helps a lot as well. So tell us about, you know, 
your experience in, in that regard? Yeah. So, so that would be a certain type of carbs, right? That would probably be like gluten-based carbs, like breads and pastas and that kind of stuff. Um, cause it, cause at the end of the day, vegetables are carbs and fruits are carbs and those things are not going to be causing you inflammation in your joints and that kind of stuff. Uh, that would be mm-hmm. coming from gluten and stuff like that. So it's not carbs necessarily that are causing the problem. And I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes in. Oh, I got to eliminate carbs because I feel better. Well, no, it's the wrong kind of carbs that you're eating that are making you feel bad. So, you know, you can eat a ton of uh, vegetables, obviously a ton of fruit. Uh, those are going to potentially have big carb numbers, but they are not going to kind of have that inflammatory effect on the body. Um, and again, that inflammatory effect is different for everybody. So some people can eat breads and pastas and they don't have that issue. Uh, but for a lot of people, yeah, eliminating breads and pastas, even if you don't feel it now, if you eliminated it, you'd feel a lot better. Um, and so you, you know, or at least limit them. You know, I, I'm not a big fan, like I said, of elimination, even the, some of those foods. Uh, but if you limit them and you focus on, you know, you hear it all the time, whole foods, right? If you eat vegetables, you eat fruits, uh, you eat, you know, potatoes and rices and those kind of things, those, those sources of carbs for the most part are not going to cause that inflammation and allow you to kind of have the energy and enjoy carbs and that kind of stuff but not um, have sort of the negative effects of that. So um, it's, it's all about education. And then it is always going to be a little bit of trial and error. And even with my clients, you know, we start with a certain plan, but it's always, okay, so how did that go? Like, how, you know, what results are we seeing? How are you feeling? And then we tweak things and adjust things as we go, uh, because everybody is going to react differently and, and everybody's body, you know, reacts to different foods in, in different ways. So it's, it's always going to be a bit of a, a bit of a, a science and an art in terms of figuring out what the right plan is uh, and getting the optimum results and making sure that you feel great as you do it. Yeah. So yeah, it does. I think that's where I'm at now. I've, I've cut down carbs, but I haven't eliminated carbs and, and most of the carbs I have are pretty good. And you know what? I feel great. You know, I do. I feel fantastic. And, and that's so. the thing too. Once you get into great shape, right, Joe, your, your body handles carbs better. So once you get into great shape and you have more muscle than you do fat, then your body can absorb those carbs and make use of them a little bit better than it did when you were out of shape. So it does make sense that you can add them back in now. Um, guys are often shocked when I tell them how many carbs I eat sometimes uh, because like, I just, it's just my body's a little bit different and I've been training for my entire life. So my body handles carbs a little better than some other guys. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just about getting to that point to start with. And then you can kind of, you know, adjust things and, and, and make sure that you're eating the way that is sustainable for you for the rest of your life. Yeah. And when I do have that carrot cake, I can really enjoy it for sure. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so uh, speaking of, of, of uh, you know, you're in better shape than most guys. We do have some video of you working out uh, and, and it looks like a, a killer, <laughs> killer exercise here. Vic, if you could roll that. Uh, uh, well, and you're, you're to slowly get lower yeah. and change the lever <laughs> you, angle as we work. Yeah. And then and you, you talk about the, uh, the gliders too. So, uh, you know, while you, while we're doing this, tell us what, what's going on here. Yeah. So this is, I mean, this is uh, I used to do a spot on, uh, on CTV news, uh, kind of a, an exercise of the day sort of thing. Uh, and so this is basically focused on the, on the hamstrings and the, the glutes. Uh, and that can be tough to do at home because there's no, you know, hamstring curl machine or anything like that. So this essentially gives you the ability to do a hamstring curl at home. Um, you know, before we were kind of doing the walkout and if you have these gliders, then you can actually, uh, do it as uh, an actual hamstring curl and kind of using the back of the legs to pull the heels in, raise the hips up, uh, and kind of work all those muscles kind of along the back side of the legs. It looks, looks really phenomenal. I, I didn't try <laughs> it, but it looks good. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah. Don't, don't yeah, neglect yeah, yeah. the legs. Those are big. Yeah. 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 No, I, at the gym, I always, I, I start the legs all the time. So, um, I, I, so yeah, yeah that's a, I asked a question. So, uh, when I, I, I get to the gym three times a week, you know, like a lot of guys will go, go daily, but it's for me, it's three, maybe yep. four tops. Uh, and, yep. and I like to do everything. Is that cool? Like I do the legs, start with the legs and I do upper body and then I do some lighter weights and reps and, and stuff like that. So <laughs> is that, is that okay? Is there, or, or should I be doing it differently? Yeah, that's, that's generally how I, uh, how I program and, and at least how I start guys off. Um, because, you know, like we talked about a little bit earlier, training with weights increases metabolism more than any other form of exercise, right? And then when you train the whole body together, you can really kind of magnify that effect. So you're just burning more calories throughout the entire day. You're training the whole body as a system uh, and allows you to kind of, you know, 
um, make you hit every muscle group every time that you go to the gym, uh, which is obviously great. Obviously, if you're if you're trying to focus on certain body parts or really body build, then you need to do you know a little bit more specific days where you know you're doing seven exercises for chest or seven exercises for back or whatever that is. But for most of us who are just trying to stay in shape and look great and feel great, training the full body is is awesome. Uh, and, and like I said, it does allow to to uh, create that that better metabolic effect uh, with each workout as opposed to doing a body part split. So, okay, I know family is very important for you. You're you're right now. You're at a hotel somewhere in Durham region at a, your daughter's soccer <laughs> tournament, which I appreciate yep. you taking this time to join us. And uh, oh, good. And my old stomach grounds as well. How's it going for the tournament? Uh, we just got in last night, so her first game is coming up this afternoon. So we'll uh, okay we'll post it. <laughs> very good very good so uh you also posted some halloween pics of the family recently uh, pretty awesome you've got a, a great looking group and and uh yeah you, you also posted uh something here um five things that kids need from their father right one unconditional yep. love two they need you to be present three they need you to love their mother four they need you to discipline them in love and five, they need you to be a positive role model. Uh, they need us to lead them not just one day, uh, day by day basis, but on the path that'll lead them to successful and happy life. What does that look like for you? Yeah, I mean, and that's it's something that I think evolves every day. Um, you know, kids are the uh, probably the number one testing ground <laughs> for men uh, because mm -hmm. there's no there's no manual, right? There's no uh, there's no instruction set uh, that that tells you exactly how to do this and. Uh, even with me, I have four kids and every single one of them is different. Uh, so parenting the first one one way is not going to apply to parenting the last one the same way. So uh, for me, it's it's really about trying to trying to um, be adaptable. And obviously, I have, you know, principles and lessons and things that I want them to learn and, and want to show them. But often it means I need to figure out the best way to do that for each individual child. And, um, you know, you talk about coaching and you talk about, you know, being a student and all that kind of stuff. Like this is the ultimate test of being a coach and being a student because you need to learn from them. What works for them is not going to work for everybody else. And how am I going to teach it the best way? And, um, you know, for me, like I said, it's, it's, it's a constant, uh, state of evolution and trying to, um, get a little bit better, uh, honestly. And, and, you know, we've mentioned that a couple of times now and, you know, I always want to, you know, you want to improve business. You want to get in a little bit better shape. I, I want to be a better dad every day. And so, uh, it takes the same amount of work, probably way more work than, than anything else I've ever done. But it's, uh, it's really just about just thinking about, um, not just what's going to be best for you, obviously, but you're trying to impart this lesson. It has to be, why is this lesson important for my child and how is he or she going to receive it the best way possible? Right. You also focus on, you know, it, it's remember that uh, children are going to follow your example, not your advice, right? Yes. And, and, 100%. and you, so you have to be a good example. And if your dad spending time in health and fitness is not selfish, it's selfless. Uh, yes. Explain that too. Yeah, I think, you know, especially as, as men, you know, when we feel the responsibility of being a father and, and oftentimes running a business and all those kind of things, there's lots of, there's lots of things that we're responsible for. We have lots of obligations. And uh, a lot of times guys will tell me they, they feel guilty about taking an hour to go to the gym. They feel like that's selfish. It's taking away from their family uh, or taking away from something else they could be doing for business or whatever that looks like. Uh, but the reality is that hour is... Uh, making them better for their family and for their business. And, you know, it's not, it, it is obviously about fitness and it's about health and longevity and, and being able to have energy for all those things. But it's also about, you know, for me, and I think for a lot of guys, like that's an hour of, that's refreshing. That is regeneration. That is, you know, uh, a stress release. That is, you know, kind of my time that's completely separate from anybody else. Nobody's coming to ask me for anything during that time. Uh, and it's an opportunity for me to to push myself and grow as a man uh, and then be able to come back to family and business and uh, just be better, be in a better mood, be functioning better, be at a higher level uh, to to give them more of myself than I could if I just if I stayed at home on the couch. And 
maybe I was in the room, but I wasn't really present because I was thinking about other things or whatever. Um, it's, uh, it, and it, it does take a, a minute or two to, to kind of wrap your head around that as you get started in the process. But once you, once you consistently make that hour, uh, and, and push yourself and, and create that, um, uh, I would say that that push for something that is for yourself, it carries over into, uh, how you show up as a husband and how you show up as a father, uh, and how you show up for, for business and those kind of things. It, it, it just all around, um, is a selfless act, uh, to get up off the couch, go to the gym, make yourself a little bit better so that you can show up for, for the people in your life. For sure. You know, and if you prioritize business or work over, or everything else, then as you mentioned, you, everything else suffers and, and, uh, you know, you keep yourself in good physical condition. You can be there for your kids. You can be there for your family. Right. And, and plus you're in Absolutely. a better state mentally and emotionally and everything else. Right. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's, it's a game changer, changer, honestly. Um, so many guys, they, you know, they, they come and they get started and they, after a, you know, a few weeks or a month or whatever, they, you know, I, I thought I was okay. I just wanted to get in a little bit better shape, but you know, I feel so much better. Um, you know, it's not just about being able to take my shirt off at the beach. I have more energy in the evenings. I'm not tired. I'm not snapping at my kids. Uh, business is getting better. Like all the different things that, you know, getting in better shape does for you is, um, you know, the, the list is endless pretty much. There, there's, a, there's not really a negative to it at the end of the day. Right. Okay. So we have a testimonial from somebody who, uh, who you've worked with who's followed your program. Uh, Vic, let's just roll that uh, testimonial. Hey, brother. How you doing? I wanted to drop you a note and tell you, uh, just finished another workout, so six months, and I'm telling you, this program has changed my life. And if you would have told me six months ago, my body would transform, my lifestyle transform like this, I would not have believed you. But uh, proof is in the method, the Elite Man method has been amazing. Uh, the program you set out, the nutrition, it's been phenomenal. I say this to anyone who uh, wants to put in the work, you can transform, you can make a change, and uh, Pat's got to do it for you. Uh, this program is, is amazing. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Any any other Super any awesome. other transformations that you've talked that you that, that come to mind? Yeah, there's there's so many. I mean, there's there, you know I've, I've got a guy who you know got guys who've lost over a hundred pounds and obviously completely changed kind of the course of their their life and their health and and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, I've had guys who uh, you know were uh, really out of shape and and in a bad place and got in better shape. You know, got a new career met a girl, got married, had kids now. Um, and, and this is a guy who's same age as me, right? So he, he was in a bad place and mentally was not doing well. And just changing your body and, you know, creating confidence around that, uh, you carry yourself differently and you present yourself differently. And that leads to, it leads to good things, right? It leads to a new career, maybe, or meeting the right woman or whatever that looks like. And, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the marketing and, and a lot of the, the talking is about, uh, and, and I'm, you know, I do it too, but like feeling comfortable taking your shirt off at the beach and, you know, looking great in, in a tank top in the summer. And those things are, are valuable. And, you know, everybody admits they like to look good, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's testimonials like that. And, um, the ones where, you know, you truly a life has moved in a different direction, maybe not because of, but as a, as a, as a result of, you know, feeling better about yourself and having more confidence and just carrying yourself in a different way uh, because you got in better shape because you lost some body fat, you got stronger, you liked yourself uh, when you looked in the mirror and maybe you taught yourself a lesson, you know, about sticking to a program and realizing, Hey, I can achieve this when I put my mind to it and I actually do the work. So that carries over into other things as well. I can achieve something else uh, if I just do the work because I, I've proven it by, by following this program and getting a great result. Well. A lot of upside. Can't see much downside. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I want to go back just to talk about your uh, your former club for just a minute. Uh, were you surprised, first of all, when the Alouettes knocked off the Argos in the Eastern Final? I mean, huge underdogs. The Argos were 16-2 and two this year. A great team. Yes. Here we are early in the game. This is the turning point right there. The TSN turning point, if you will. Yeah, it's uh, Chad Kelly's pass inter intercepted by Mark Antoine Decoy. Decoy is 105-yard pick six. Al's had a couple of those in the game. Went on to yep. beat the Bowman 38-7. It wasn't even close. And no. they booked their ticket to the Great Cup. I was stunned. Were you as stunned as I was? 
I was. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, you look at the, the season overall, and I don't think anybody doubted that Toronto was the team to beat. And, and obviously you had to go through Toronto to, to get through the playoffs. And um, it's, it goes back again. And, and uh, I think this is obviously true in any sport, but I think the CFL has a special, like if you get hot at the right time, it doesn't matter what the regular season looked like. You get hot at the right time and everything starts clicking. Um, you know, you, you know, you can take a, you know, we've had obviously nine and nine teams that have gone on to win the great cup and uh, teams with losing records. Uh, I think too, that have gone at least gotten to the great cup, but it's uh, it's one of those things where, you know, because it's, it's a one game playoff, you know, you get hot and uh, the other team, you know, has a bit of an off day, anything can happen. And uh, I certainly did not see the, uh, the Toronto game uh, coming that way. And, and then, I certainly didn't expect them to back it up again in the Great Cup the following week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let's talk about that. But you know, I, one other thing I was impressed by though is uh, is that big crowd they had in Toronto too. That was really nice to see. And here you are, of course, the big game. Uh, Blue Bombers were seven point favorites heading into this one. Al's rally from ten down. Cody Fajardo hit Austin Mack there. Then final minute, an impressive victory here. Chapman Fajardo yeah. hits Tyson Philpot for a seventeen yard score. Philpot was. Top Canadian in the game, like yourself. Fajardo was yeah. the MVP. Al's rally to win it 28-24. Uh, first of all, did it bring back some memories for you? Uh, absolutely. You know, uh, as soon as uh, as Tyson caught that ball, I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. That's, uh, you know, a young Canadian receiver uh, making the big play in the Great Cup and and uh, and basically winning the game for his team or at least being a part of that play. And, um, yeah, that was – there was definitely a, a little bit of – yeah, that, that feels familiar uh, when I watched that play. It was uh-huh. an awesome play by him. And, and really, you know, the whole game by the team there, you know, uh, they just got hot and, you know, their their coach did a great job. Their quarterback did a great job. And really just the, you know, I think in the locker room, you create that from, um, you know, it has to come from having some success on the field. Uh, but, you know, the, the coaches and everybody just has to, guide that belief and foster that belief because when guys believe you know anything is possible when you step on that field and you know you kind of saw it those those two games you know that the montreal team on paper didn't didn't have any chance Mm -hmm. of winning Uh, the alouettes believing in themselves and uh and you know they were able to hang in there and eventually it turned around yeah 100 percent. it's you know it's it's one of those things that you know obviously it has to come from action you have to have some uh, some evidence that you can do it, but also, you know, the coaches, the players, everybody just has to foster that belief and really, you know, really truly embrace it to step on the field and believe that, you know, even though on paper it says we don't have a chance and all the media says we don't have a chance, uh, those of us in this room, we believe and we know that if we get the opportunity, we can make the plays that we need to to go out and do this thing. Yeah, I have a friend who's a big Alouettes fan. And he, yeah, he asked me before the game, he says, do you think they have a chance? And I said, you know, if they can hang in there for a while, you never know. This thing could happen, yeah. right? So that's it. And, that's and of it. course, they did. All right. So question I like to ask my guests is, what's the best advice you've ever received? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, I think the best res- advice I've ever received um, w- was probably just to, to always be learning. Um, you know, I think it's really easy uh, for guys, as we, especially as we get older and maybe we have success with things is to think we have it all figured out. And we, we know, we, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing more I need to learn. I just need to keep doing what I'm doing. Uh, and I think that that really, you know, limits what you're capable of uh, because no matter what your, uh, what your business is, what your life is like, there's always opportunity to learn uh, how to be a little bit better at this, a little bit better at that, uh, maybe eliminate certain things from your life. Um, and I think just allowing yourself to be open to new knowledge and allowing yourself to be a student of uh, people who are maybe doing it a little bit better than you or maybe do it in a different way than you, uh, that you can maybe take lessons from that, apply it to your own life uh, and make things a little bit better. Yep. Everybody can have something to teach me if I'm open to hearing the message, right? Exactly. hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can follow Pat uh, on Facebook, Pat Woodcock on X at elite coach 16 on Instagram at elite coach. And uh, the website is the elite man method.com. You got it. So Pat uh, continued success with the career. Good luck to your daughter this week. Hopefully she wins today. And uh, thanks for taking the time to join us. Yeah, thanks so much, Joe. I really enjoyed the conversation. 
This is fun. Yeah. All right. More sports when we come back. What our kids breathe matters more than ever. But how can you tell if a school is safe to breathe in? If you could actually see what's in the air, would you keep them home? Introducing Air Patrol, making the invisible visible, ensuring schools are safer for everyone. Breathe safely. Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center, saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life. Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. MNP a leading Canadian national accounting, tax, and business accounting firm. MNP proudly serves and responds to the need of their clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Through partner-led engagements, MNP provides a collaborative, cost-effective approach to do business and personal strategies to help people and organizations to succeed across the country and around the world. With local offices in Oshawa, Mississauga, Burlington, and more, their team is here to support you. Visit mnp.ca today to learn more. And we want to thank all the folks who make this show possible. These are friends, trusted business associates, and all around great people. We highly recommend them all. A reminder that the show is available on iTunes, Spotify, Breaker, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, and Pocket Cast, as well as the Spanglish Network, Buzz TV, and Zingo TV. Also, check out the show on YouTube. All of our past great shows are there. Clips, shorts, like and subscribe. It is absolutely, positively free. Thanks once again to Pat Woodcock for being on the program. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. Let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family in your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did. 905-686-5678. Air quality at work matters more than ever. But there's no way to tell if a space is safe to breathe in. If you could actually see what's in the air, would you even come to work? Introducing Air Patrol, making the invisible visible, ensuring workplaces are safer for everyone. Breathe safely. Rooted in 60 years of tradition, Sleepy Hollow is a private golf club with a friendly community of members just minutes from Toronto. With mature trees and rolling fairways, Sleepy Hollow provides a challenging and enjoyable experience for passionate golfers. Enjoy great golf, amazing dining, and a picturesque patio second to none. Visit SleepyHollowCountryClub.com. Hi there, I'm Joe Tilly. Are you ready for an adventure of a lifetime? Next March, during the enchanting cherry blossom season, join me and my wife for an unforgettable two-week journey to Japan and South Korea. In Japan, you'll experience the magic of the season as we visit the stunning Osaka Castle against the backdrop of cherry blossoms. Feed the adorable Sika deer at Nara Park, glide through picturesque landscapes on the famed bullet train, Cruise on Lake Kawaguchi and witness the awe-inspiring view of Mount Fuji. Relax in natural hot springs and savor a delightful Fuji dinner banquet while dressing in traditional robes. And of course, we'll dive into Tokyo's cutting-edge technology scene. In Korea, dress in elegant hanbok attire and step back in time at Changdok Gong Palace. Wander through Andong Village, a true glimpse 
into Korea's rich heritage. Delight your taste buds with the flavors of Korean barbecue. We'll even visit the DMZ area to get a glimpse of mysterious North Korea. And guess what? This incredible journey is all yours for just $54.99, all inclusive with direct flights from Vancouver or $58.99 from Toronto. Book now to unlock up to an extra $1,700 in upgrades and savings. Let's make some memories. Let's explore. Let's travel. Guests on Joe Tilly Sports receive a gift certificate from Classica Imports. Top of the line, imported men's clothing. Check out the Classica Essential Collection now. Go to shopclassica.com.